All right, turn to, turn to Luke chapter 19, if you would. Um, we're starting a four-week series titled Conversations with Jesus, and uh, we're going to look at some of the interaction that Christ had with people. We're going to learn some things probably about ourselves, about our faith, and other practical thoughts. When we finish this series, we're going to tackle the book of Esther. Maybe some of you have studied Esther, maybe you haven't, but uh, we'll be looking at the book of Esther. And then I've got another series that will be topical, and then we're going to hit First Thessalonians. We're going to have a lot of fun this year. we got some stuff that we're going to, we're going to challenge ourselves with. But this one, called Conversations with Jesus, it's Jesus and a man that is disliked by many, as we're going to find out. Um, so Luke 19, so follow along, we'll read the first five verses from the, the chapter, and then we'll get into the Word. He, that's Christ, entered Jericho, and he was passing through, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So, so he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, by the way, this statement by Christ is going to cause a major stir in Jericho. We'll talk about it. Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So let's pray again, shall we? Father, I do again thank you for your, your awesome grace and mercy. Thank you so much for our worship team that brings us to the throne every week and God, I pray just as we look at this story today, this conversation that Jesus has with a man that is not liked in his community, may we learn some things about our own attitudes and heart towards people and ask you to be with us. For it's your name we ask it. Amen. I get these emails from a pastor and college professor named Chuck Lawless. Yeah, that's his last name, Lawless. Chuck, for 47 years, has prayed for the salvation of his mother. 47 years. At the age of 79, two weeks ago, his mother came to faith in Christ. And what was really cool in his email this morning, he sends out one every Sunday, he calls an encouraging word. He sends it to those of us that are teaching on Sundays. Today he gets to baptize his mom. But what I really thought about was, you know, how easy could it have been for him to give up on his mom, right? How many of us have prayed for more than a year for somebody and when they didn't make a decision or things didn't quite go like I thought or we thought they should, all of a sudden you kind of set that off on the shelf of prayer, you know, you figured if God hasn't answered it now, he won't. I think that if there were any believers in Jericho, as we're going to read about this morning, if they prayed for Zacchaeus, I wonder how many of them got to the point that they just said, forget this. This guy is never going to come to Christ. He's a crook. I mean, he's a swindler. He's the scum of the earth, you could say. I mean... This guy was not, as we'll see, very well liked. So let me kind of set the stage for what's happening today, all right? So we've circled the two places. Jesus comes to Jericho. Jer he's on his way to Jerusalem. Now Jericho is uh, the last major stop on a particular route if you're going to Jerusalem. But here's the deal. When you left Jericho, Jerusalem was about 18 miles away. And it wasn't a downhill descent into the city of Jerusalem. In fact, you went uphill. You ascended about half a mile by the time everything was done. And you traveled through this gorge. It was a well-traveled road, but it was known for robbers. Uh, it wasn't uh, the safest place to be. Of course, if you were traveling with a crew of people, which Jesus was, you get into this rocky, dangerous gor you know, gorge that took you, that you had to go through 
from Jericho to Jerusalem. So Christ is making the last, what you and I would think would be the obvious stop on his way to Jerusalem. See, sometimes in the Bible you'll read this. For example, you might read a passage that says uh, somewhere that somebody went up to Hebron, for example. I'm just throwing this out. You and I would look at a map and we'd say, well, wait a minute. You don't go up to Hebron. You go down to Hebron. Sometimes when you read in the Bible where people say they went up to somewhere or down to, they're not talking about the location on the map. They're talking about how high above sea level things were. It's, that's how they did that in those days. So the Bible's not telling you something that's wrong, all right? It's how the writers think in, the, in those days. So you would read, if you were in Jericho, you read, well, we're going up to Jerusalem. But we'd look on a map and say, no, you're not. You're going down. But actually, you're going up because Jerusalem's up here in elevation and Jericho's down here. Anyway, they said it would take six hours or so. You had to be going at a pretty good clip to do that. But this city was, like I said, the place that normally you would pass through. Um, there were basically two main groups of people in Jericho. It's caused a lot of tension in the town. You had the group of the priests, the religious guys, and then you had a whole bunch of tax collectors. IRS agents. And uh, because Jericho was a major city on the trade routes, and that's how Rome collected money, man. They taxed you. You think we have it sometimes bad. They were really good at really up in the ante. And so you had in this town, you had the priests and the tax collectors. They wouldn't like each other, number one. And then if you were anything but a tax collector. You hated the tax collectors. We'll talk more about that. So there's a little bit of tension in Jericho. Jericho was actually, in the ancient world, a pretty cool place to go. It was known for its climate, so the royalty of the day would build these enormous palaces in Jericho. and They had swimming pools and gardens and bathhouses. They had a hippodrome. Anybody know what a hippodrome is? It's not where you race hippos, okay? It's where you had chariot and horse races, right? They had one of those built in Jericho. They had a big theater. So this was really a happening place in the first century. It was known for its palm trees, its balsam trees, cypress, you name it. One of the funny things is that uh, Zacchaeus' name, who we're going to call Zach, because I'm not going to keep saying Zacchaeus. You know what his name means? His name means bright or pure. A last thing that you would think about looking at a tax collector is this guy was pure. Because he was, he was a wretch. He really was. So on your outline, we're going to start, we're going to jump down to verses 2 through 4, and we're going to get started, all right? So that just kind of sets the stage for you. Now comes this incredible conversation that Jesus is going to have with this guy Zacchaeus, right? So grab your outline, just follow along. We'll make some comments as we go. It's going to be a little different this morning than normal as we just walk through the interaction that takes place, and then we'll do a few practical thoughts at the end, all right? So what does verse 2 tell us about our buddy here? Behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a, I love this phrase, chief tax collector, and, the la and then the next three words, and was rich. And there's a reason that this is emphasized, right? So let's say that you were a, living in Jericho at the time, and Rome came to the city. What they did in the Roman Empire was, in certain towns, you would bid to be the tax collector. So you would offer, you know, tell Rome what you would collect for taxes, as long as Rome got their cut. Uh, so you would bid as high as you could, within reason, in your thinking. And if you won the bid, you therefore were the head guy of that community. So when they, people came traveling through, or people bought goods in the town, you were the one who made sure that the taxes got collected, okay? 
So probably Zacchaeus had won a bidding war, so he now, not only did he set this high rate of taxes, but on top of that he had to add more money to collect. Why? Because he had to get paid. What does it say about him? He was what? Rich. Not only that, he had to pay guys that he hired to actually do the tax collecting. So he's either the chief, meaning that he's won the bid and he's got these guys working under him, so he's always charging high rate of taxes, not only to those coming through the town who were traveling, selling goods, or going from city to city, but even within his own town. Some people think maybe he was the guy that collected all the taxes and then turned it into Rome, maybe so. But I think that Zacchaeus had won this bidding war, and that's why he was known as the chief tax collector. And the phrase, he was rich, will be important in the story, okay? So here he is, um, this tax collector, and uh, we've already said it. If you're a tax collector, I can just share this with you. You are hated. The only friends you have are fellow tax collectors, you know? Nobody else wants to be around you. Nobody nobody likes you because you're ripping people off. And so that's going against him. And so I started thinking as I read this about Zacchaeus, here's a guy who's not very, probably very kind. He's a guy that takes advantage of other people. He's probably not a guy that you would really trust with your retirement account. Um, And I asked myself a question. Even though I don't have any tax collectors in my life, is there a Zacchaeus in my life that I have a hard time with? Is there a person in my life or in your life that you have a hard time praying for them? You have a hard time loving them? or caring about them. You know, maybe it's somebody you work with. Maybe it's somebody you go to school with. Hopefully it's not somebody in church, but it might be. I know it couldn't be me. The point is, Zacchaeus's are in everybody's life. And sometimes... I have to look in the mirror and do an attitude check because, yeah, there's some Zacchaeuses that I've dealt with. How about you? The person that just makes it hard. And I think that that question drives me to do a real thorough look at my attitude towards other people. Because this guy, for whatever reason, people at Jericho cannot stand him. And we'll see that in verse 7. But he's the top dog for collecting taxes. And, you know, I looked at that, and I, again, that challenge of there, there's a Kiosis in my life certain personalities. That we, I mean, we all struggle with different people. We do. But sometimes we write them off and we need to make sure we never do that. You know? For the people of Jericho, this guy's a sellout to Rome, so you can't expect them to like him, right? So in verse 3, we, here's where we, now we get to know a little bit more about him. When Jesus came to Jericho, he was not traveling just with the disciples. I believe there's evidence that he had a large crowd following him. I mean, he was pretty popular by now, right? He's really on his last journey to Jerusalem. And he's got a crowd following him. No doubt when he enters the city of Jericho, people in the city of Jericho want to see him. They want to hear what he has to say. Maybe they want to see if he's going to do any miracles. And surprisingly, our buddy Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. There's a problem, though. What is it? Zacchaeus is short. When I was reading that, I thought about uh, the song many years ago by Randy Newman called Short People. I don't know why, 
But that came to my mind. And then there was always the one in church where we, we little, what was it, Zacchaeus? What a wee little man was he? I don't think you should say that in our culture. But anyway, the point of it is he was probably less than five feet tall. That's kind of the thought, okay? So obviously he can't see above the crowd. Did you see him just kind of jumping up and down, trying to see Jesus? What I think is really funny is he climbs a tree, okay? I mean, it just doesn't seem like this professional tax collector should be climbing trees. But whatever reason, he wants to see Jesus. Back in Luke 18, 17, Jesus talked about having faith like a little child. And I kind of think, you know, what was Zacchaeus? Was he, was he now beginning to think there was something more to life when he heard Jesus was coming to town? And Christ is a very popular rabbi by this time, a very popular teacher in Jerusalem and in the surrounding areas. And so as I get this glimpse of Zacchaeus, I just see a guy who... Maybe he realizes something's missing in his life. You know, even as a Christian, there are days that you feel like something's missing in your life. Right? Maybe you're struggling in your walk with God. We all do. Maybe you just feel just there's this real emptiness and you're wrestling with stuff. Or like we said, you have the Zacchaeus in your life that right now your attitude towards is not very good. Or maybe we're like Zacchaeus. Beginning in verse 4 and then into verse 5. So flip over your notes. I'm just walking through the text. So I'm just, all we're doing is just making note of where we're at. So we're in verse 5, all right? I want to make a couple of comments here because it's kind of important to get the mindset of what's happening. So in verse 4, we read this. He climbed a sycamore tree. Kind of like a fig tree in the ancient world. There were lots of them in Jericho. It could grow up to 45 feet. It could tall. It had good, stern, sturdy branches. So Zacchaeus climbs up high enough that he can see Jesus. And then verse 5 occurs. Now this has to be a mind boggler to the people of Jericho. Look what happens. We read it, but let's read it again. When Jesus came to the place, so he's walking through Jericho, he looks up and he sees who? Zacchaeus, right? And then he says, he's never met this guy. There's no evidence that Christ has ever met Zacchaeus. I'm going to say something about that in a minute. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down. Now look at this. For I must stay at your house. Let me say something here about Jesus. There are those who teach that when Jesus came to earth, he laid aside his, quote, attributes as God. Uh, when he became a man, that's not true. John 17 is very clear from the words of Christ himself that he had laid aside his glory. He never ceased to be God when he came to earth. There's at least three occasions in the Gospel of John where people wanted him dead because he claimed to be God. He came to do the Father's will. We know that. He's very clear on that. So he followed the will of the Father, but Jesus never ceased being God. He had never met Zacchaeus. Nobody in the passage here told him there's that knucklehead in the tree, Zacchaeus. He's walking, turns, looks up, and knows who it is. Why? Because he's God. It says that he knows what's in the hearts of men, even when he was here. People say, well, wait a minute. He said in Matthew that he didn't know the day or the hour of his return. You have to read the context of what he's talking about. The disciples are desperately wanting to know, Jesus, when are you coming back? And he says, you know what? Don't worry about that. That's in the Father's timing. I don't think that in heaven, Jesus is sitting on the edge of a seat waiting for the Father to tell him when he's to come and get the church. Because I believe Christ knows when he's coming to get the church. 
The context determines what a meaning of a verse is. Jesus did the Father's will. He did miracles in the name of the Father. He always pointed to the Father. But he never ceased to be God. So he turns, he knows who this is. This is Zacchaeus. But notice the word must. It is necessary that I go to your house today. Whoa. Now imagine. Listen. Imagine that you're there in the crowd and you're standing next to Jesus and he turns and he says that to Zacchaeus. And you're going, what? I mean, it's like, Jesus, you got any idea who this guy is? If you're in a person of Jericho, uh, more than likely you're a little torqued because you're never going to invite Zach into your home. And he's never going to invite you into his. What it reminds me of, Jesus reminds us and reminds me that every single person needs either salvation or if they're a Christian, to grow in their relationship with God. I look at this and Christ looks at him and says, you know, Zach, I want to come to your house today. And let me tell you this, that if you and I were there and we were listening, let me ask you, what would be your first thought? Here's what I'd think. Good. The Lord's going to sit down with this guy and he's going to straighten him out. He's going to nail him. He's going to tell him how he's messed up how he's taken advantage of all of us here in the city. I mean, that would be my thought. In fact, I'd run over to Zacharias, Zacchaeus' house so I could stand outside and listen into the conversation. Because I'd be going, yeah, the Lord's going to smoke this guy. He's going to take him on. He's going to straighten him out. And everything that I think should happen to people like Zacchaeus... Jesus does the exact opposite. You know that? The Zacchaeus is in our life that sometimes we have a hard time with. And we kind of wish that the Lord would get a hold of him and shake him up. Maybe he will. But maybe he'll use you or I in their life. You ever thought about that? But if you're in Jericho, you're disappointed that Christ in your mind, isn't doing more. That he's not calling this guy out. And it has to be tough. And then I look at verse 6, and here's what I read. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. So I don't know if Zacchaeus, where the word joyfully here means that he's kind of patting himself on the back that this well-known itinerant preacher is coming to my house and I feel pretty important. Maybe he's thinking that, I don't know. Or maybe, really, there's, he's at a point in his life like every person in this room gets to. That there's something more to life than getting up, going to work, coming home, getting up, going to work, and coming home. Maybe Zacchaeus' disapproval or dislike by so many people in his community has begun to bother him a little bit. I don't know. But the whole situation shows me this. God does what God wants to do in the way that God wants to do it. Jesus is doing everything contrary to what if you lived in Jericho, you would do with Zacchaeus. Let's be honest. You have a Zacchaeus, maybe you deal with the work or at school. And you kind of got what you wish would happen to that person. They get fired uh, or something, you know, or something at school. They get transferred because you just don't want to deal with them, things like that. And, and then God comes along, and if you're a Christian, he speaks to you, and he He says, why don't you treat your Zacchaeus like Jesus does this Zacchaeus? See, I'm more prone to be like the people of Jericho, are you? 
I find it easier to judge. Drop the hammer, you know, right? And I'm not saying there's not a place to call out sin. The Bible is clear there is. But when we see somebody struggling in their walk with God, we're to con- go to them out of love and confront them because of the destructive nature of what they're doing. But that's not on the mind of most of the people in the city of Jericho when it comes to Zacchaeus or any other tax collector. Because they've had hammered into their head when they would go into the synagogue in Jericho, the religious leaders would use people like tax collectors as the obvious example of a person who is worthless and is a wretched person. And so for years, if you're in Jericho, that's what you've been told. So you already believe that. And now you're thinking, well, he's working for Rome. I hate Rome. And he's collecting taxes for this empire that I don't even like being in our territory. I mean, I can have those type of attitude towards people. It may not be that the guy's a tax collector, but I just don't like this, I don't like that. Instead of praying for them and trying to reach out to them, I kind of sit back to see if God's going to drop the hammer. I've done that. That's what they're doing. If we were climbing all over each other to get to the window to hear the conversation that's going to take place in this home, we are going to be disappointed. Because it's not going the way that we think it should. Now, it tells us that Zacchaeus, he's happy that Jesus is there. and Maybe he is looking for answers for his life. The people have gathered. Look at verse 7. So it says verse 6, Zacchaeus hurried, came down from the tree. We're glad, okay, I'm glad he didn't stay in the tree. And he received him. Okay, into his house. Okay, received him joyfully. Now look at verse 7. And when they saw it, the people, when they saw what? That Jesus said to Zacchaeus, I got to go to your house today. When they saw this, what did they do? They were overjoyed. They were so excited. Oh, they did what everybody does. What did they do? They grumbled. They complained. They griped. Isn't that amazing? You ever done that? God, you're not doing it the way I think it should be done. Jesus, do you have any idea who this guy is? He is the scum of the earth, in our opinion. And yet, you're going to go to his house, so they're turning to each other. It's not like one guy just said something. The whole crowd starts chirping to each other. They're griping, they're complaining, uh, you name it. That's what they're doing. Because in their mind, listen to me, there's no hope for this guy. Zacchaeus has no hope in their eyes of ever being anything different than he is. Are you, aren't you glad that God didn't feel that way about you? I was 16 when I became a Christian. Some of you became a Christian younger in life, some of you older. I'm glad at 16 that God changed my life. I was thinking this morning when I was coming in, I thought, I started preaching when I was 18. So for the last 20 years, the last, let's just say, few decades, uh, I've been doing this. And, okay, 46 years. Happy? Okay, there you go. Um, But I thought to myself, I'm so glad that somebody didn't look at me and think there's no way that you can change and there's no way that God can touch your life. Aren't you glad that people didn't think that about you? You were only a Christian because of the grace of God. Nobody deserves it or earns it. And these people are irritated at Jesus because doesn't this guy get it that Zacchaeus is like the worst of the worst. In fact, look at verse 7, what it says. When they saw it, they all grumbled. And then it says, He has gone in to be the guest 
of a man who is what? A sinner. This isn't just, you need to understand this word. This word sinner just doesn't mean, it's just not a broad word, you know, just used to say, that guy's a sinner. It's used in such a way that you would look at somebody and say, that guy's like the worst of the worst. You ever thought of that about somebody? It's like that guy is so evil, he's so bad, he is so just, he's the worst. And this word was used at times to describe like the worst sinner in town. In the minds of everybody in Jericho, if they had a top ten list of sinners, you know who's number one? Zacchaeus. He is number one on the charts. He is the worst of the worst. Specifically, the Greek word is used to show that. And uh, so these people are beside themselves. They're thinking, there's just, does he have any idea of what he's doing? It's like they think Christ is clueless, right? They're complaining, they're grumbling. I probably somewhere and mentally over the years have had a, maybe not a top ten, but a top five of people that I dealt with that I thought, well, that guy's like the worst. And you know what happens? God changes them, and then you're humbled because you're looking at him like you would a Zacchaeus. You're wasting your time. Why even pray for him, care about him, show mercy or grace to him because there's no hope. So Jesus visits the home of Zacchaeus. And then something happens. Here's the thing. I can't, I would have loved to have seen what happened in Jericho. Even a couple of weeks after what, ha- what we read about. Look at verse 8. I love this. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. So all the people are grumbling, Okay. Zacchaeus stands up, and he's going to speak not only to Jesus, he's going to speak where anybody can hear him. All right? So let me read verses 8 and 9, and then we're going to talk about it for a minute. Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Wow. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything... I restore it fourfold. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he's also a son of Abraham. Let me say something here. It, Jesus isn't saying, Well, since Zacchaeus is going to do these things, that makes him a believer. No. He has this incredible change of his heart. And he says, you know what? You notice how it says, if I've defrauded anyone? That phrase means that he had. Okay? So here's this guy who is filthy rich, probably lives in the house, in one of the houses in Jericho. The Old Testament only requires that you give back whatever you took plus 20%. Look what Zacchaeus is willing to do. Everything plus 40%. Oh, now if you're a guy who's out standing at the window and he says this, and you're one of those that he's defrauded, wow, this is pretty good, right? Because you're thinking, I'm going to, this is good. I'm going to get not only what he took from me, but he's giving me 40% more of that. Man. But what amazes me is that Zacchaeus just lays it out there. And the proof of his coming to Christ is in his life. This teaching that goes on today in different churches, I would not say the majority, that there is no evidence that you're a Christian if you ask Jesus truly into your life. I'm telling you, I don't agree with that. I don't. People say, well, what, how much fruit does somebody have to show to, to, to let people know they're a Christian? I don't know. Some. 
I don't know what that looks like. We all grow different. Jesus even said that. Some grow 100-fold, some 60. I mean, we all grow different. But the point of it is, when a person truly comes to Christ, we don't understand everything about the Christian life, but God begins to work in our lives. It's not always instantaneous. The moment I got saved, I wanted my friends in school to know about Jesus. But that doesn't, that's not always the case that you automatically, all these things happen. We grow, we change, but there's always evidence if you truly know Christ. James 2 teaches it. Paul teaches it. 1 John teaches it. I could go on and on and on. Um, in fact, and this is going to sound like a plug, and it's not meant this way. When I wrote the book, The Great Divide, which I did write, and it was on the doctrine of salvation. Because I've heard a lot of teaching over the years that was not the true, was not the gospel. We don't earn our way to heaven. You're only saved by grace through faith in Christ alone. Okay? But there will be evidence of that decision you make at points in your life. We will struggle. We will sin, sometimes terribly. But there will be evidence. Zacchaeus just happened to decide at that point, the Lord has changed me, and I need to do something about it. And so he says, I'm going to repay everybody. I'm going to do, and it's almost like he's, he is apologizing. And I wonder if the people of Jericho were like I have been when somebody truly came to Christ, I got skeptical. Right? Because then you sat back and we began to watch. I wonder, I wonder if it really happened. It's not my job to sit here and follow somebody around to see if they're truly saved or not. Oh, you'll know. The evidence will be there. Somebody will see it. But we need to learn from the story a few things at the bottom of your page there on the back. We all deal with our own Zacchaeuses. We do. We have maybe have been a Zacchaeus to somebody by our attitudes and our actions, the things that we said, the things that we did. Maybe we need to go back to somebody and say, you know what? I was wrong. I said some things. I did some things I shouldn't have. Forgive me. Or maybe the Zacchaeus in our life that it's just we're struggling with him tremendously. We need to look in the mirror, James 1, the mirror of the Word of God, and let God's Word change my attitude towards those people. I need to pray for those people. You ever just think of the Sermon on the Mount? Jesus did it different. He taught like the opposite of what people expected. What did he say? Pray for your enemies. What? Really? No Jew was ever taught that by the religious leader. And so Jesus comes along and he says, I want you, I want you to pray for your Zacchaeuses. I want you to even do good to them. Luke tells us that. Be kind to those that rub us the wrong way. You know why? It may not change them, but what does it do? changes us. I want to challenge you this week, if there's a Zacchaeus in your life, to pray for them. If they don't know Christ, that they would come to know Christ. If they do know Christ, that God maybe would change our attitude towards them. And then another lesson, and this is for all of us, because some of you feel the pressure sometimes from people that, because they know that you're a follower of Jesus, they don't always make life easy. When Zacchaeus made that decision to follow Christ, he could care less what other people in Jericho thought. He was not going to let anyone else stop him from knowing Christ and showing Christ. Because there's going to be times, and you know it, some of you feel it, some of you hear it, the things that are said just simply because you're a Christian. But don't ever let that stop us from doing what we know we need to do. And a third thing I thought about, when Jesus touches our life, nothing's the same. Our growth in Christ will differ. 
But every one of us can attest to things in our life that since we become a Christian are different than they were before. Right? I mean, that's reality. I love this story. It's been years, I think, since I even talked about Christ and Zacchaeus. I didn't go into my files and try to blow off the cobwebs or something message because I thought, you know what? I want to learn some I want to learn afresh this conversation that Jesus has with this guy that nobody likes that you know the people of Jericho would love for him to move away, not be part of their community. He's a he along with the other tax collectors are a black eye on the community of Jericho in the minds of all the people. And then I thought about this, and we're done. Zacchaeus coming to Christ, I wonder what that did to the other tax collectors. If they stayed in the same business, Zacchaeus might try to reach out to them, but if they want to keep doing what they're doing, they don't want anything to do with him. So now he's kind of, he has nobody really that's his friend, right? But maybe there were some believers in Jericho that when they saw what happened, they thought, I don't care what anybody else thinks. I'm going to invite Zacchaeus to my house. He's a new believer. I want him to know that we're here for him. Every Zacchaeus that you meet, a person with the attitude that this man had before he came to Christ, they need to see in the Christian a different perspective on life than they see in the world around them. Because we're the ones that hold the hope that they need. We're the guys with the message of hope. You can find more messages like this one at oakridgebc.org and like us on Facebook for encouragement and event updates right to your newsfeed. Thank you for listening to today's message from Oak Ridge Community Church.